All right. Welcome again. Uh, I'm now, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker for our very first Headwaters Lecture. Uh, and so this uh, lecture series, the Headwater Lectures, are uh, events made possible by CFAN's funding, also through the Campus Compact. And this is a new series. The idea is that we're going to invite uh, nationally and internationally known field-shaping scholars to campus, probably three or four of them a year, uh, to discuss frontier research topics of interest to the water uh, community here. And so our inaugural lecture, which is today, is embedded within this event, um, but we're going to have future ones as standalone events, so watch the announcements for those. The next one will be coming up at the end of March. So when uh, we were sitting down with the planning committee and we had identified uh, the intersection of water and data science as our theme for today, and we were discussing uh, who would be the nationally or internationally field known field shaping researcher to invite, uh, we quickly realized that we didn't need to look any further than our own Keller Hall. And uh, so it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce Vipin Kumar, uh, who's a Regents professor and holds the William Norris Chair in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering here at the, at the University of Minnesota. His research interests include data mining, high performance computing, and their applications in climate and ecosystems and healthcare. He's authored over 300 articles, co-edited or co-authored 10 books, including the wi widely used textbooks on parallel computing and data mining. He's received many, many honors for career achievements. He's a fellow of several uh, societies, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and received the highest award for technical excellence in the field of knowledge, discovery, and data mining. So please join me in welcoming Vipin Kumar to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And, and it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, it's, I'm a computer scientist, as, as you, you can tell uh, uh, from my background. Uh, and, uh, uh, for the last uh, a couple of decades, I have been sort of uh, dealing with some of these domains that relate to the environment uh, and, and the earth. And uh, more recently, um, we have started looking at the, uh, the problem uh, connected with water and how uh, big data, the machine learning that, that you hear all about in the newspaper in many, many different contexts, how uh, these technologies can, can help address uh, um, what we are facing in the domain of water. So of course, this is like preaching to the choir, but of course, water, as this community knows, as, uh, as it's uh, the focus of the uh, research here, is, is becoming, turning out to be a great a challenge uh, as we move into the 21st century, and, and for many, many reasons. If you look at the, um, the developments over the last one in the century, the population has gone up by about a factor of 10. The uh, per capita use of water has more than doubled and the amount of water on the surface of fresh water that's, that's usable is, is very, very limited, less than 1%. And, and as a result, it's quickly becoming uh, clear to people that we're gonna, fee, uh, we're gonna see very large amount of shortages in, in, in for water. Our World Economic Forum is, is, is projecting about 40% uh, demand uh, exceeding supply by about 40% in you know, the 10 year, 10, 12 years or so. And all of this is becoming more challenging uh, and more uncertain in the context of climate change. In 2017, if you read the newspaper today, it, it's, it's tying with the second uh, um, warmest year in, in, in the recorded history. And all of the three warmest years have been in the last three years. So climate is changing, and it's having a huge impact on the water cycle. Probably the biggest impact uh, the society would feel uh, is through the water cycle, and it's making the droughts and the floods more frequent. And we have seen many of those examples uh, just in this country. And, and of course, certainly you see uh, droughts in California, you, see, you sort of see the, so the floods in the Houston, and then uh, many hurricanes in this country, droughts in Southern California. And at the, at the lower end of this figure here, uh, uh, you can see the shrinking Lake Mead. This is the largest reservoir in the United States that sort of feeds about 20 million people in, in California, Arizona, uh, and uh, Nevada, 
and it's at the 40% of its peak capacity, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty routine in most places, and in, uh, many many factors are coming in the much more obvious in, in California. And it's not just the quantity that's, that's of concern, it's the quality of water as well, which is a so great focus of, of the meeting here. Uh, uh, the uh, interaction between agriculture and water, runoffs of, of uh, nutrients from the fields or from uh, impervious surfaces into water supplies. And you see that in, uh, uh, in, in ha uh, harmful algal bloom in, in Lake Erie, making the water uh, undrinkable for, for lots of people. And, and so forth. So there are all of these things that are coming together and becoming a major challenge. And to address this challenge, uh, the other side of the story is that over the last several decades, especially going back to the beginning of satellite era, but as the computers have become faster, we are seeing more and more data becoming available. You see the satellite scanning the Earth. You see the animation here and from NASA uh, on, the, on the top left corner. We have all sorts of um, uh, climate and weather models generating massive models. There is in the hydrology, there are a huge number of models, many developed by people in this audience, and they are creating massive amount of data. And then and there's this term called Internet for Water that's coming, coming along for a good reason. That is, it's possible to, to measure <coughs> a water uh, supply even in your homes uh, and your system through the smart meters and, and smart sensors. And they hold uh, tremendous potential for reducing the wastage, for uh, forecasting demand, for uh, um, you know, for repairing the infrastructure, and so forth. So together, all of these have created a torrent uh, of uh, data, digital torrent of data, which which is tremendously promising. And why should it be promising? Because this happens to be, um, by all means, is the golden age of data science. You know, as we call it in computer science. That is the uh, and, and the reason I mentioned this phrase here is that, of course, the, the scientific fields have been working with data for, for all along. Without data, there is no science. And in computer science, of course, computers work with data all the time. But what has changed in the last 10 years or so is that the data has become tremendously plentiful, not just in the domain of water, but, but every walk of life. You carry cell phone in your pocket. It's creating data every minute, every second when it communicates with the cell tower, uh, or, or when you go to uh, Facebook, when you go to web, you, uh, you do anything, you're creating data and it's being recorded. And all of these data sets that are sort of uh, becoming available are, are making our life more manageable, more livable, perhaps more interesting, more entertaining. And of course, it's also creating things like fake news and such, right? You know, there's all sorts of things happening. But the, the tremendous amount, uh, the tremendous um, uh, ways that big data technologies are changing our world. In a few years, you will see more and more self-driving cars. There are already some on the road. Uh, you see computer programs beating, you know, world champions in chess or world champion in, in major games. Um, uh, every time you do any commerce, any, any you interact with any uh, uh, anything, you're sort of you're being your activity is being supported by big data. And, and, the, and the question is, could this, uh, um, so could this sort of help uh, address some of the challenges that they're facing in the domain of water? And that's what uh, this talk is about. And what I'm going to do is try to see as to how some of these big data and machine learning technologies that have revolutionized everything we do in life, how can they come to help uh, deal with some of the challenges? And in, in that context, I am going to talk about one major project that we've been involved in over the last three years uh, in the context of building a system for monitoring the surface water on the Earth at, at a level of resolution uh, in both space and time that could not be imagined uh, uh, until recently. And then I'll conclude with many other possible examples and some of which we're working on uh, uh, that can also utilize some of these uh, uh, methods from um, uh, machine learning data mining. And one thing that is um, uh, that you will sort of notice in all of this discussion is that even though the machine learning and big data technologies offer tremendous opportunity for advancing the water sciences, but the, it, it, it turns out that many of these techniques cannot be used out of the box. So you have to come up with new innovation, uh, modify them to be able to work in this problem which becomes a, a very interesting uh, uh, exercise of collaboration between computer science and, and domain sciences in the sense that 
computer science advances by coming up with new methods, and of course, you're solving uh, problems that are interesting to the society. Okay? So coming back to this problem of being able to map the surface water uh, on the Earth. Okay? And again, it's important for many, many reasons. Uh, I mentioned to you uh, climate change, uh, and it's, of course, impacting the water supply around the world. And then again, there are many, many ways you can see the impact. And one of the, the ways we'll get to study a little bit more carefully, but it's of great interest to people, is uh, uh, with the warming, the glaciers on some of the big mountain tops are melting. And one such place is Himalayan glaciers in Tibet. Uh, they feed rivers that uh, provide water to about 2 billion people on the earth. Very, very large area, about a third of humanity. And these glaciers are melting. And then they melt, they create lakes uh, or increase the lakes on the mountain tops. And a lot of these can be studied uh, from the satellites. And it's a huge concern as to what's happening, what is the dynamics, how are these, uh, what would happen to these glaciers as we move into the, uh, uh, the century further. And, and to be able to study this, you need to be able to figure out what's happening to the surface water on the Earth. Okay? The human activities um, uh, can tremendously impact the water. And of course, one of the key example one of the poster child of this is Aral Sea in, in the former Soviet Union, which is one of the largest freshwater lakes in Asia. Uh, uh, and you can see its picture in 1989 and also in 2014, which is uh, a, a sliver of what it was before. And it was, again, purely because of the diversion of water uh, for agriculture uh, from the two rivers that were feeding this uh, the system from north and south. And they were diverted for cotton farming, and then eventually it sort of... Uh, uh, made the, the lake disappear, and it has changed the, the microclimate and, and hydrology of the entire region, and it's considered to be a major ecological disaster. And again, if you are, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of, as I mentioned, the, 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 one of the, uh, the, uh, the hazards of water is, of course, too much water can create floods, and, and you build, people build systems, hydrological uh, models, to be able to forecast uh, these floods and to give proper warning. And, and again, uh, the being able to map surface water has a major role to play there. And, uh, and if you're able to do a good job, it, you could do many, many things. It can help you uh, quantify the stock of water and flow around the world. And I see one of the posters here from John Lieber trying to do that for the state of Minnesota. And again, uh, this information can come into play from many, many perspectives, not just trying to figure out how much water is there, but how much water may be flowing through the rivers that may cross river that, they may, that may cross nations and continents and in states, and, and a lot of the information is not available to the, 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 uh, the, uh, to the planner, uh, the people who are in, involved in planning and policy. Uh, and again, you can provide uh, valuable data for the hydrological models. There are many, many possible uses of being able to do the um, uh, map the surface water on the globe. And it turns out that there's a lot of data that's becoming available to be able to do that today. You know, if you ask this question maybe a few decades ago, it will be extremely hard question to answer. Uh, but today, we have satellites scanning the Earth. Uh, and uh, you see the animation of the MODIS uh, instrument on, 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 on satellite Terra and Aqua from NASA, which take a picture of the Earth every single day at least once. So every, every place is being monitored at least once at a very coarse resolution, about a square kilometer is pictured into four pixels. So it's a very, very coarse pixel. St. Paul campus would be just about you know, a few, do a few a dozen or so pixels. But given that data, which is multispectral in nature from passive sensors, you can create um, uh, spatial, spatially explicit data going over time. You know, this data has gone on for almost now about 18 years. Uh, every day you have a data. Right? And again, this is not the only one. Landsat goes back about 40 plus years. Sentinel just came into operation a couple of years ago from the Europeans, and it has a much finer resolution, uh, not as uh, not the daily frequency uh, every five, five to 10 days, but it's a much, much better quality uh, data. So there are many, many such data sets available. And then the list goes on beyond that to commercial data set that are not as public as, as these. But the importance of uh, mapping surface water is so great that shuttle, the NASA flew a mission of space shuttle in February of 2000 just to map the water uh, on the Earth. So this SRTM, the shuttle uh, uh, mission for, for mapping uh, for water in February, it has led to a multiple data sets, and one of them is, is actually a well-curated data set that sort of tells you exactly how the water looked like 
the surface of water looked like in, 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 in February of 2000. Right? And more recently, um, uh, an example of what I'm talking about um, is, is, is another product from Google and a European uh, joint study that they produced using Landsat. Uh, not a surface water body product, but at each Landsat pixel, whether it was uh, water or not, at any given date in a month, uh, they tried to sort of recreate that uh, product. So it's basically, this sort tells you all of these data sets actually then become a, a very important source for being able to capture the dynamics uh, uh, on, on the uh, water of water on the earth. Okay? Now, given this much data and given this much possibility of a training data, uh, it, it would appear to, a, a, uh, to someone who has a, 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 has a rudimentary knowledge of machine learning that perhaps this would be a very, very easy problem to solve for, for the computer scientist. And it turns out it's actually very challenging. And, and it's challenging for a number of reasons. And one of them is that the nature of data, uh, the nature of how the, the water looks like, in different places can, look ex can, can be extremely different. So what you're seeing in this picture here is the, um, uh, the false color composites of, of the, um, the multispectral data. So it allows you to look at the multispectral data, but, but visually. And, but, but visually, if the data set looks like, you can sort of see that all of this data looks like something different than all of this. And, and you can sort of look at this and say, this must be water body and this must be land. But you can sort of see that this is very different than the land. But if you go to a different location on the globe, you will see that the water here looks very, very different than the water here. And the land color here looks very different than the land color here. And these are all, of course, false colors, right? Okay. So not only water bodies look very different in different parts of the world, but the water body at the same location in Argentina, for example, at two different times can look very, very different. So there's a huge amount of heterogeneity. And that makes it very challenging for traditional machine learning algorithms, which, which assume that the training data set that they have is representative of what is going to be uh, applied in practice. And then if you're taking data sets from February 2000 and applying it on a different date, it could look very, very different and you could make mistakes. If you take data set from certain areas and if you apply it some other place, it would look very different. So this actually a huge, huge challenge. But there are even more uh, interesting challenges or more difficult challenges. And, and give, to give you an idea, I'm just showing you the animation of, again, the false color composites of a lake in China, a Poyang Lake. Uh, it's, it's, it's not too far from Beijing. It's a freshwater lake. It supplies water to the, to, to the regions of Beijing. And from and, and any time you see the animation here, and whenever you see the orange color, that means the data is missing. That is, there's no data, right? And then as you can see here, most of the time, there is no data for most of the pixels, right? And data being missing is actually not as bad because you know that you don't have the data, so you don't know what, what to do there. You know, the, uh, but what becomes even worse is the data is not, data is bad because of the aerosols, and the aerosols can actually change the, the spectral characteristics, and which means when you feed that data to a machine learning algorithm, and whenever you think you have the data, but actually you don't have the right kind of data, and you actually would get wrong results, right? So this is yet another problem. And then list goes on. And, and if you're trying to, to map water, there could be algal blooms in the water that would look like land. There could be mountain shadows that would look like uh, water and so forth. So the list goes on. And all of these problems make it super challenging for the traditional machine learning algorithms uh, to be able to uh, do a good job, okay? So, so, so basically, you know, uh, when we embarked on this project about three years ago, uh, we, we sort of had to head, head on address these challenges, and I'm not going to go into details of those. There are a whole bunch of papers written by uh, people in computer science, the students in our group, uh, and that probably is not of interest to this audience anyway. But it involved developing uh, methods for uh, dealing with ensembles that can deal with heterogeneity, and, and, and a series of uh, uh, innovations like this. But there, was, there is one theme that sort of uh, has come to, to, to come across and that, that probably be hidden in, in most of my talk, and that is being able to not just use machine learning algorithms as they are, but also use something special about the, the domain that helps you make these algorithms much smarter. And I'll give you uh, an example of it. It actually looks a very simple example but it, it, it's a very powerful uh, information uh, feed into the whole system. So if you look at the, uh, the, if you look at the water uh, on the surface of the earth, 
it's not going to be appearing in random locations. It's going to be, water is going to always exist in some sort of a cavity, in some sort of bowl on the Earth. Okay? And as a result, if, if you know that information, then it sort of automatically tells you that if in, the, in a water body like this, let's say we have the intersection of a, of a water body here, this is of course certainly deeper than this one, and if I happen to call this location water, if my machine learning algorithm calls this area to be water and this area to be land, then I know that something is wrong, right? So what also it means is that if I happen to have the elevation map of the Earth at a very, very fine level of detail, I can use it in conjunction with my machine learning algorithm to make it really smart, okay? What happens is that I don't have a good elevation map for the Earth, okay? Or at least for most part of the Earth, and at least at the level of uh, resolution that I would need. Uh, to be able to map surface water on the Earth. But it turns out that it's possible to build a machine learning algorithm that can make use of this fact without knowing the elevation. So what I'm telling you is that, of course, the water bodies exist in a cavity, which means you cannot have a water at a high location and land at a low location in the same bowl, okay, which is obvious to all of us. Right? And if I knew the elevation, then it'll be very easy to see how it could be incorporated into the algorithm. But what I'm saying is that I don't know the elevation, and yet the algorithm would somehow incorporate this information in such a way that it'll make sure that whatever maps it creates would be consistent with this phenomena. Right? So it, it, seeing exactly how this is done is a much longer talk, but this is, this is sort of a key element of this whole thing. And actually, this would go uh, this observation sort of goes pretty far uh, in, in doing many things. So using this collection of techniques and this observation that I just talked about, now we have a system that anybody in the world can go and, and, and sort of look at on the web. This is the URL, okay? And once you come here, you can actually go around the globe and at your will, look at the dynamics of any water body on the world, and of course the only caveat at this time in this public system is that water body has to be large enough. It has to have at least 10 modis pixel, which means about a couple of square kilometers, which still means there are tens of thousands of water bodies that are captured in the system. Okay? So it basically captures the dynamics of all major surface water bodies, you know, uh, shown as blue dot, and there's a, um, uh, there is a tutorial uh, information sheet in the system, so you'll be able to sort of get to it. Uh, sometimes the system works even from an uh, iPad or, or as an iPhone, but generally, you know, a laptop is, uh, or a computer is better. But you can, once you go to the system, you will be able to see the melting glacial lakes uh, around the world uh, or at, at mountains, changes in river morphologies. You will see identification of reservoirs being constructed around the world. Uh, I will show you there's an interest here in being able to map the, the ground water storage, and, and which of course is typically done using GRACE, and then I'll show you the connection between GRACE and the surface water, and, and, and sort of stories that we of course would not even know uh, how to interpret, okay? And just to give you, so, uh, so the next few slides are gonna sort of tell you what some of these changes are that you'll be able to see if you went to the system. So <clears throat> if, you, if you went to a certain part of the world, if you clicked, uh, the dots would appear, circles would appear, uh, and each circle would represent uh, a water body, uh, so this is how sort of, you know, you would see a bunch of water bodies. And, oh, let's see. And the system would allow you um, to see the size of these water bodies over a period of time. So what you're seeing here is this water body, which is Don Martin Dam in Mexico, uh, in, the, in, the state, in the country of Mexico. And you will see here in this map that this, this dam was about 400 pixels, about 100 square kilometer in area in February 2000, became smaller, then became big, then became smaller, then became big, and so forth. So you know the entire dynamics of this in terms of aggregate values, but you can also see the actual area, the actual um, uh, extent of it. And, and just to help you verify that the, these changes are actually correct, for most of these places, you also have access to this annual maps that are not very good quality, from Google time lapse. And the system allows you to do all of this in the sense that you, know, you click and you will see all of this without any effort. 
So for this one, you can see this, uh, and these are the animal images. These are daily images, but these are eight day composites. These are animal images, but animal images actually will sort of tell you, yes, it did became very large in 2003, then it became small and so forth. So you'll see uh, the dynamics to be very, very consistent with what the, so it's almost like a verification, uh, but of course we'll show you verification then in a much more sensible way later on. You can also color these dots by different colors to show you what happened over the last 18 years in terms of whether these water bodies shrank or that they grew. Maybe they appeared someplace, they were not, there were no, no water. So in this picture here that you're seeing here, anytime a water body looks like this, very small number of pixels and became bigger and bigger, it is considered to be uh, red. And if it's shrinking, then it, it's labeled as green. So you can see all over the world, water bodies, some of them are red, some of them are blue. Uh, you see a lot of the red water bodies here in, in the Amazon, in the northern part of Brazil. Lots of these are very massive hydrological dams, right? But you also see green water bodies. I'm gonna to come to this in a minute. You see uh, red and green right next to each other. I'll, I'll come, come to those as well. So there are all sorts of phenomena that you would see that are very interesting. And you can see them on a global scale. The best part is that you just, with a mouse, you're going around the world and you're seeing all sorts of things. And uh, I sort of uh, promised you that I could sort of show you this. Uh, uh, there's this huge blob of green, and we didn't know anything about Argentina. This is what happens to Argentina. So we, we zoomed in. It turns out everything here is, is, a, is a green blob, okay? And if you look at this green blob, collection of all of these green blocks in this entire box, and you count the number of pixels, they're almost like 20,000 pixels together, like huge, massive area, right? Thousands of square kilometers of area of water uh, existed back in 2002, then came down and almost shrunk. And it's all agricultural area. Maybe somebody who works in that area would be able to figure out that there was an interaction between agriculture and water over there. Okay? You could actually, you could, using Google time lapse, you can actually look at any of these water bodies and you can see them growing and shrinking pretty much according to the same uh, eight day composite map that you see here. So you can sort of see that yes, some of the phenomena are so large that you can see them uh, from a time lapse. Okay. I mentioned uh, these glaciers melting in Tibet. Before this, we could only look at a study done in 1990 for a, uh, uh, for a Landsat tile. People would show with this Landsat tile that was, this glacier was so big, and in 2005 it became so big. Now here, the system, when, when we looked at it, uh, we found a whole bunch of red dots right here. And a whole bunch of red dots means these uh, bodies are increasing and, and, and the water bodies are increasing. So you can basically, uh, on the system itself as you would go, you will see these water bodies increasing by seeing that this black water body is the one that it existed in 2000 and the red areas are the increasing area. So you can see all of these increases uh, uh, on the screen. These are the bowls that sort of grew because the glaciers melting increased them. You can see them uh, everywhere. You can see them and you can verify them using the Google time lapse for some of these large bodies. And you can sort of see, uh, uh, this is the timeline for the time lapse and you can see th this older time and then it's increasing. So, and it sort of happens for all of them. Pretty much you can sort of see this area increasing in, in a very similar way. Uh, and so for, and again, all of this you can do on, on, the, on, on the website automatically. You can collectively also figure out in this entire area in Tibet, how many thousand square kilometers of new water has come out? You know, it's like you can quantify these things and by looking at the altimeter data, you can even quantify how much water quantity actually have emerged out of these uh, the, um, glaciers into it. So again, this is an example of how many different things you could do so easily. Again, the power of big data combined with machine learning, uh, making products available for people to study. Okay, now I, I told you that a lot of these places you see the green and red dots right next to each other, okay? It, of course, this was puzzling to begin with, but it turns out that this green and red dots come together when the rivers meander, because when the rivers meander, some place becomes less water and some place has more water, okay? And you can see them right here, okay? And this is actually very interesting for us because the reason we started working on mapping water was three years ago, Professor Effie Fufula, she from civil engineering came to us and she sort of said, well, there is this river Vikuali uh, uh, which is right here, uh, can you create a, for a certain reason, a meandering map for us going back 40 years? So we started creating a map for a small reason all the way back, and in the process we sort of said, well, while we are doing it, why don't we do it for the whole world, right? 
And this is, this is what we got. But then when we got it for the whole world, then we got all sorts of other things. So, so, the, uh, so it's uh, the River Ukiali uh, meandering map, the paper that got written on it, was on the, uh, the, it was the feature story at AGU, uh, the big conference uh, 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 about a year ago. But to us, this became a lot more interesting because now anybody can look at anything all over the world, right? So this, this, was, this was very interesting for us. Now you can see, uh, because you can see this all over the world, so you can sort of see what's happening on the coastlines. Okay? And a lot of the things that you see on the coastlines are simply sand moving from one side to the other. River is draining, the delta is collecting water, sand from one side to the other. But some places you can see some, something in action too. You can see this island off of South America, uh, 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 off of Brazil, this blue area that you're seeing here, it is all eroded. Okay? Our system says this has become water. It was, it was land before it has become water, right? And, and you can see the erosion right here. You can see the erosion in, in Google time lapse. If you watch it carefully, you would see that over a period of oh, the last several decades, this area, the, the ocean has sort of crept in. So you can see phenomena like this, right? So that, that is something that would be very hard for you to sort of uh, see on a global scale. Okay? You can see dams being constructed uh, all over the globe. Now that's, a, that's an extremely important problem for people who are uh, environmental engineers who are looking at the interaction between uh, the dams and the ecology and the fisheries and the impact upstream and downstream. That, that is a huge thing. Actually, the rest of the world, uh, we have been in, uh, building lots of dams except in North America and in Europe where we are dismantling some of these dams because they're not considered to be, some of them are not uh, good enough. So, so here is, of course, a dam built in Japan and uh, built in 2005, and you can see that through the time lapse that yes, it showed up uh, in 2005. I think this, this video is not working very well. But on the, on the website, you'll be able to see all of these things very nicely. All the system is sort of telling you is that there's a region here, this water body had very few pixels, almost no pixels until now, and suddenly it had a very large size, so you, that means uh, and this is how the water body got mapped. And once you have a map like this, a follow-up algorithm simply said, what are the water bodies that are suddenly jumping in size? And those are the dams, uh, possibly the dams. Now, using this machinery, we can build a database of dams being constructed all over the world. Now, this is the problem of getting trust uh, to the extent that there is a, a database called Grand, Global Reservoir and Dam Database, called Grand Database which is used by the hydrological community, by people in environmental sciences to study these dams that are intact. And this dam, this database was constructed in late 1990s uh, with great care, and I think it's fairly complete uh, for 1990. And after that, it has simply relied upon people around the world to self-report. If somebody builds a dam, they're supposed to sort of send information to this dam database and they will enter it, okay? So this is how many dams this database has since 2000, okay? Because we have the data from 2000, we can find any dams constructed since 2000 automatically. This is how many we find, okay? And for each one of them, actually you can go and on the Google Earth and see the concrete. So you, not only the system found it, but one of the students sat down and just went through each one of them. It was easy, once you find a dam, it's very easy to go on Google Earth and then zoom in and you will see the concrete and you know it's a, it's a dam. So you can sort of see, of course, you'll find them in usual places. You'll find them in China, you'll find them in India, you'll find them in Brazil, you'll find them in you know, all sorts of places that you would expect, right? So, uh, and, and then you can sort of uh, uh, study whatever you like to study. Now, there was a, uh, there's an interest here uh, by in being able to study the groundwater, right? And oftentimes people would study groundwater using grace, using the, um, uh, uh, the gravity, gravity sensor satellites and the changes in gravity, okay? So we wanted to see, and, and we had no clue what we we're gonna find, what is the relationship between the underground water storage that is sensed by GRACE and the surface water that we are able to sense from the system, okay? So what I'm gonna show you uh, on the next slide is going to be a correlation heat map of what is found by GRACE and what is found by our algorithm. And of course, GRACE is a very, very coarse uh, uh, a system, we have a, uh, we are able to, uh, we have a coarse mapping of the water, but even for a square kilometer, even though we have only four pixels, that's actually very, very fine. If you look at from the grace perspective. So basically we made them sort of similar at one degree resolution. We sort of said at one degree resolution, we have the grace data. Let's compute in that one degree how much surface water is there and how it's changing. 
So we have two different time series and we can correlate them and we can compute a, a correlation heat map. And we thought this map would be all over the place in the sense that you know, who knows what the correlation would turn out. And what you're seeing here is this correlation heat map is mostly red. There are a few places of blue and I'll come to that. And red means very, very high correlation. This is looking at 0 0.8, 0 0.85, very, very high correlation. That means, that means the, the underground water dynamics and the surface water dynamics is matching very, very nicely. Very surprising, okay? And I'll just give you an example. This is a sort of a place in, 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 in southern India, uh, and you can see that the, the red line is the grace line, uh, the gravity uh, sort of showing you how much surface water might be changing over a period of last uh, 20 years or 18 years. And the blue line is the line computed by counting the amount of surface area that we see through our system, the system that you will be able to see uh, on this public light. And you can see that there's a pretty, pretty, pretty good ups and downs that are sort of matching. And of course, they're not supposed to match exactly as underground and surface water are, have differences, but you can see them pretty nicely matching. And this is, what it, this is what it means to have this kind of color. And you see this color all over the place, right? And of course, some places you will see blue color. And let me explain one of them to you. So this is a blue, blue cover where you see the grace is saying the surface water is going down. And the surface water computed by our system is saying it's going up, right? And it turns out that it happens not just here, but here, but all over the belt, right here. All the way up to uh, the tip of Vietnam. And in all of this area, if you see, people are pumping water and growing rice or doing aqua farming. So through the satellite, it looks like you have water. But, but you're pumping water from the ground. So, so this, this, is a, this is a big story from the, both the fact that the water tables are going down, which is known to people, and also that this agriculture, the aqua agriculture they're doing actually is very visible from the space as well. So this is very, very interesting that you can sort of see all of this phenomena all the way in this part of the world, uh, 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 the relationship in grace and surface area. What the fact that we have such high correlation between grace and surface area in most other places means that we may be able to provide information about the groundwater at a higher resolution in both space and time, perhaps going go back at 40 years, looking at the correlation between grace and the satellite data in the recent time. So there's a possibility of using this to project things backward in both high resolution in space and time. Okay? And again, this sort of, this list sort of goes on. Now I am just going to uh, uh, talk about one more thing here, which, which is sort of a, a, another very, very interesting possibility of machine learning. This is a very recent work. Uh, it has not made it into the system that you will see online, but it, it's, it's taking this work to a, a, a much higher uh, level uh, uh, in terms of usability. So, so far on the system that you're gonna see are the maps that are built using MODIS data, which is daily. Uh, at 500 resolution, that means a square kilometer has four pixels for water, okay? And the data that you see on the, ma on, on the website is eight-day composite because, because the, the, even MODIS data can be so noisy that oftentimes within an eight day, you might have only one good look. So it's, it's, it's much better to work with the eight-day composite than trying to build a picture every day. Now, the question is, can I produce a daily map of surface water not a day map, not, not a monthly map, not a yearly map, but a everyday map. And can I do it at a very fine resolution? Not at 500 meter, but perhaps a 30 meter, perhaps a 10 meter. And it turns out that if you could do that, if somebody could do that, it's not used most of the time. You know, mo most of the water bodies are not changing every day, uh, uh, every hour uh, at, at, at a very high resolution. But if you could do that, you can actually quantify stocks and flow of water in ways that could not be done before. So for example, with a few more steps after this, you could even figure out exactly how much water is flowing through the rivers around the world from one country to the other, from one region to the other. Um, uh, you could actually create, a there's a possibility of creating uh, calibration data for the hydrological model, uh, for calibrating the flood training models and so forth. Many, many things can be done if you could do something like this. And it turns out this is very challenging. Why? Because the high resolution, the, the daily data is available at 500 meter resolution. Okay? 
Landsat, which is available at 30 meter, is available every 16 days and extremely poor quality. So many places for the entire year, you may have only one or two images for, for a certain, certain area. Sentinel-2 European satellite is available, but number one, it is available only for the last two years. It's supposed to be available every five to 10 days, but in a year, you might only have a dozen pictures uh, at many places, and it's only 10 meters. So, so the, but what I'm hoping to do, and actually what I'm gonna show you, is the possibility of building 10 meter and 30 meter resolution maps every day. Okay? So, so this is, and again, you sort of say, how could you do that? And I'm gonna bring you back to the bowl phenomenon. That is, the water exists in a, in, a, in a bowl. That means there's an elevation there, and even if I don't know it, I can somehow infer it, and then I use it to, to figure out exactly what the dynamics are. So that, that observation that I made earlier is gonna come into play, and I'm just gonna show you results. I'm not gonna go into exactly how I'm doing it. And what I'm, sh I'm showing you the first result, which is sort of simply a statement, which is sort of saying, here is the reservoir, Kazakai Reservoir in Afghanistan. It's part of a river. This is a daily map of uh, this reservoir at a modest scale. You can see these big chunks, uh, square chunks, because 500 meter resolution. This is the day July. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I'm showing you the animation for about two weeks. Okay? And then the same reservoir is being mapped at a 30 meter resolution, and you can see it's very, very fine resolution. Of course, you don't know if I'm doing a good job yet, right? But I, I'm just showing you this map. On the next slide, I'm gonna show you that what I'm doing is really some, something really good. So what I'm saying is that this is what I'm observing using MODIS data, and this is what I'm creating. And jump from here to here goes through that story that I told you earlier. Okay, and I'm not going to tell you anything more than that, right? Okay, so this, this is, so now I'm gonna sort of tell you that what I'm showing you here actually really makes sense, okay? Oops, so let's see. Uh, I think I'm going the wrong direction. Oops, okay. Aha. I'm finishing the whole talk without uh, the proper sequence. Let me see if it will just let me do it. Okay, yes, yeah, I'm back on track, okay? So to, to show you that this thing really works, okay? Uh, so I, we went back and created, for many regions in the world, daily maps, okay? Now once I create a map, how do I convince you that it's a really good map, okay? Because our map is created every day, so I can pick up any day for which I have high resolution information and try to see if I'm, I'm doing it correctly. So I found a map for Landsat 7 on December 13, 2000 for Lake Mead. So this is how the Lake Mead looked like on December 13, 2000, and this is the, the background picture, Landsat picture, okay? So this is visible to us. Now this is the map that was created using 500 meter MODIS data. Of course, but the map you're seeing here is shown exactly on the same date but the map that you will see on the system online would also look pretty much the same because in eight days the lake doesn't change very much anyway, right? But this is how the map looks. And, and it looks jagged, you can sort of see that little jagged here, but it hugs the lake very, very carefully, right? Okay? But still you cannot see if you're sitting in the back, you really don't know uh, what's going on, so I'm gonna zoom in. Uh, okay, oh I see, so this is how the jagged map looks like. Okay, so I guess I'm, I'm in the back. So this is how the jagged maps look like. And this is how the corrected map looks like, which actually makes it 30 meter map, which is very, very precise. And of course, you cannot see from the back, so I'm gonna zoom in on this area. And this is how the jagged map would look like. And this is how the corrected map would look like. So I did not see the image at 30 meter resolution, but I'm really mapping it at 30 meter resolution. Now, to, to really give you a sense of how precise it is, I'm gonna zoom in here. This is how the jagged map looks like and this is how the corrected map looks like. So this, is, this almost feels like magic, but if you look through the machine learning literature, you will, you will find cases like, oh, somebody has a very fuzzy image of you, and you can recreate a perfect image of you. It's the same technology. That is, you're going from the coarse data to a fine data, uh, except in this particular case, you're using the physics uh, to go from it, okay? And to give you a sense of mapping at 10 meter resolution, I'm gonna show you the, another reservoir, Richmond Chambers in the USA, and this is the MODIS map, which is pretty jagged, and this is mapped down to 10 meter resolution now. We're not looking at the Sentinel image, we're just looking at the MODIS data and some mathematics to get there, okay? Come here, you, can, you see this is a jagged map, 
you can see this jagged map like this. And you can sort of see this, this thing reconstructed perfectly without looking at Sentinel data. So the background is Sentinel data. We're using MODIS data, and we're reconstructing that. Right? So this sort of gives you a sense of the possibilities that machine learning can do. Now, this is not going to be available on the, on the global system, but this can be done now for every place in the world every day uh, uh, going back um, at least 18 years through the MODIS time. Now, this, this was, all of this, what I talked about, was about mapping the surface water on the Earth. Right? But there are many, many other applications of big data, some of which we are involved in, and I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, uh, actually, let me start, start with this one. Uh, this is a project that actually just got funded uh, from the NSF Infuse program under the leadership of Jeff Peterson, which looks at the interaction between the agriculture and, 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 and water pollution uh, in Minnesota. Um, uh, when, when the land rain falls in April and in November, which is becoming more frequent, the, uh, the, uh, the chemicals run off into the water. And to, to, to help reduce that runoff, farmers are uh, asked to plant cover crops. And, and the question is, can we do a good mapping of these cover crops from the, from, from the satellite data to be able to promote these practices, to monitor and promote these practices. And again, the same technologies that you've seen in the same types of technology that you've seen in the mapping of surface water can now be used to create maps like these. This is a, a map in Minnesota, about uh, southern Minnesota, about 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer. This has, this map is mapped by Sentinel uh, satellite, which is about 100 million pixels in this map. And each pixel is mapped separately uh, into whether it's a cover crop or it's uh, something else. And you can sort of figure out exactly who's growing cover crop, who's not, who's growing alfalfa, and the red guys are cover crop, and the green ones are the people who are growing crops, but there's no cover crop on them. So you can do a very, very precise job. Right? Just to give an example of similar interaction between land and water, there is this uh, uh, collaboration we have uh, beginning with DC Water. This is a utility in, that supplies water to the Washington, D.C. area. And, and they, were, they had to build a billion dollar tunnel to sort of, uh, um, uh, to, to basically reduce the impact of runoff from the, from the oceans into the, into the river system. And that raised the, the uh, rates for the utility for their constituents. And they had to sort of figure out exactly how do we justify that. And they sort of said, okay, let us create a digital twin of the Anacostia River uh, in Maryland and then show to people that how the changes in the surface water bodies contribute to, to the, uh, the contamination uh, in, in the water, and which, of course, takes money and resources to clean up. And this is a project in which all sorts of federal agencies are involved. And the goal is to be able to go back 40 years of satellite data and recreate the entire uh, 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 river system from some uh, uh, the, the, the area, the watershed here, in terms of what it was 40 years ago, how it changed over the period of time, and how that may have changed the, uh, 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 the quality of water that they're supplying. So this is a very, very exciting project. Another uh, project that we're beginning to be involved in is being able to build a hybrid physics data models. And then let me just explain that to you. Almost uh, people in this community very extensively use models, hydrological models, process-based models, to model all sorts of things. And again, for example, uh, we're working with USGS uh, in Wisconsin to model the, uh, the water quality in, in the lakes. So they have hundreds of lakes in the Midwest. Uh, they build models uh, uh, to sort of model the temperature of those lakes. These models are very complex. They have to be calibrated for each lake. And the calibration process is very expensive and often not very good. And we are exploring the, the utility of bringing machine learning technology and these modeling technologies together to improve the modeling of these lakes. And it's a very, very exciting project. It's just, just getting off the ground, but it has implications far beyond just uh, modeling of, uh, of the temperature. Uh, it goes far beyond. Then there is a very exciting area of that sort of arises from the opportunities from the IoT for water. The, all sorts of sensors are being placed in this, in this water uh, utility system that can provide tremendous opportunity to create profiles of water use, to project demand for water use, to see where it may be being wasted, where it may be opportunity to repair the infrastructure. And, and this is just a beginning uh, uh, area, sort of beginning interest. So this hopefully gives you 
the different possibilities that big data and machine learning can bring to the table to, to address some of the problems. Uh, hopefully start some collaborations. We, of course, people like us in computer science are always very excited to work with people who are working with societal problems. And let me end here and, of course, thank my team, uh, a very bright student. One of them is in the audience, uh, Ankush Khandelwal. And, of course, we have many, many other collaborators in the university and, and elsewhere. Thank you again for your patience. Thank you, Vipin. We have a few more uh, minutes for questions for uh, Dr. Kumar. There is one. How often is the, the GRACE map updated? I think GRACE uh, data is available every year. Um, I have the information in, in that slide. It's a very coarse map. Basically, I think John Niebuhr is in the audience. Maybe he can, uh, he, he knows the answer to this question. I, we just simply use the data. Uh, um, oh, one meter resolution monthly since 2002. Yeah. It has the information. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> John, right John agrees. I, I was not keeping this slide, but I guess it, it was really handy to have this. Has there been any uh, comparing the monthly grace maps compared to, say, you know, like uh, the growing season and impacts on groundwater? Ah, I see. No, no, we haven't done that, but you can actually see the maps created because we created this map monthly. We took the monthly data, and what you're seeing here is the monthly maps here. So I, I suspect that there would be a possibility of seeing dips in areas which are driven by irrigation, because agriculture is driven by irrigation in many places. And, and I'm pretty sure um, uh, there will be a possibility of seeing that. But what you're seeing here is monthly maps. Recomputed. Yes? Uh, just one comment and then a question. Um, I'm pretty sure I did read a, a, a news article that Grace has ceased science operations this past fall. So Grace is no longer collecting data. Um, the uh, question is, have uh, you looked at uh, radar satellite systems for their potential for water monitoring in this case? Uh, I know the Canadian Remote Sensing Center has been doing a lot of work with that. You can actually use the phase shift from one day to the next in interferometry to actually get water level changes, uh, elevation changes. Oh, oh, oh okay. And so the other advantage to radar is that they look right through clouds. Clouds are not, they do not impact, they're not impacted by clouds. Yes, yeah, okay, very, very, very good question. So, so two things, the radars, the, the, the active systems have been around for quite some time, which would shoot a, a, a stream to sort of measure the, the height of the water, okay? And those data sets are available for, I, th I think there are at least three different satellites that, that sort of have this data set. But those have the height data available only for certain part of the world. And actually, this is how we convinced the remote sensing community, the water community, that what we are doing is really good because we created these maps of surface water and we showed them that wherever the, the height data was available, we could see connection between the surface area and the height. That is, the height was going up, the surface area is also going up. Right? So this was one way of sort of showing that yes, there is a consistency. But to really do a good thorough job on that, NASA is launching a mission called SWAT. You might have heard of that. And it's going to go up in 2021. And that is going to give a much more complete coverage of the Earth uh, in terms of the, the height information, every 10 meter resolution, not every day, but every few days. So there, there's a lot more data of the kind that you're talking about going to become available starting 2021. Going backwards, the data is much more sparse and we use mostly for validation. Yeah, I'll just uh, comment on the water levels in rivers that with high resolution monitoring from satellites possible to quantify water level elevation in rivers. And if you have a high, resol high enough resolution topography data, that along with principal conservation of mass, you can actually quantify the flow in the river. So it might be a way of quantifying flows without a monitoring system in place, which we have a lot of rivers without any way of measuring flows currently. 
precisely. So this, this idea of creating daily maps at a very high resolution came exactly from that motivation because rivers, most rivers don't have the, the gauges. And, and this daily surface map along with elevation data can actually go much farther in figuring out what the, what the flow may be. Yes. So what, in this, in this space where you're clearly at the leading edge, um, what, when you think uh, in the evening, would allow you to sort of progress most rapidly in a direction that you would like to is are some of your largest sort of bottlenecks right now. And I mean, I want think think broadly. I mean, I know you know my connection, obviously, with supercomputing. But graduate students, uh, the quality of data actually being generated that goes in, feeds into these models. I mean, what do you have some thoughts on that? To be able to do this, so the question, I guess one could, I could pose the question differently. Well, we are able to do this today. Why couldn't somebody do it 10 years ago? Okay? Or why couldn't somebody do it somewhere else? So there are many, many components of this that sort of have to come together for this. One of the big components of, of, is this data. Okay? 20 years ago, there was no such data available. Today, data is available. Other big component is computing. We have been blessed on this campus to have a very, very exclusive access to high performance computing at a level that most of our peers cannot imagine. Okay? And I have, I've been using it for the last 25 years, the MSI, and, and that has been extremely instrumental uh, in, in a lot of this work. Okay? And, and of course, we, have, we have work with MSI, we work with NASA, we work with Google, we've used resources all over the world, but having a very uh, good set of resources right on campus is absolutely critical. But beyond that, what is needed of course, good smart students. We have plenty of them in our department. But even more than that, what we really need is very good collaboration, like John sort of said. Look, you know, somebody wants to map the flow in the rivers. I know everything but accept this information. It, it becomes so much easier to work with people who have all of the ends of this solution except one or two that are being provided by data, and then it just comes in uh, to, to actually together. People in computer science cannot become hydrologists. They cannot become groundwater specialists. They cannot become uh, ex experts in monitoring lakes and so forth. So it's the collaboration that sort of uh, is, is perhaps one of the most one of the most important things. Well, great, uh, and thanks for your presentation and those answers. I see that we've come again to the end of our time. We really appreciate your talk and for this good discussion.